Hi folks, we're just gonna give it another minute or two before we kick things off. Welcome. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's LF networking uh, webinar. Um, the title and topic today is VPP in your home lab. Yep, right now. Today's webinar is uh, comes to us from the FIDO team within LF networking. Um, so we've got a great group of, of speakers here for you today. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we do full intros. Um, all of our attendees are on mute. However, if you have a question, there's a Q&A window at the bottom right of your screen. So feel free to type in a question anytime uh, during the presentation. Uh, we have reserved some time towards the end for open Q&A, um, but feel free to type in your questions anytime. Um, some of our panelists may uh, may go ahead and uh, answer those questions uh, in text in the chat form, um, but we will reserve time for open questions at the end. Um, and also this recording will be available for on-demand viewing within the next couple of days, so stay tuned for that. All of our registered attendees will get a link emailed to them with the on-demand link. So great. Um, today's host is Audian Paxson. He is with NetGate and he is going to be speaking with uh, Dan Stroyfert. He's with ADSB Exchange, Mike Jennings of Vox Telesis, and Jerry Wilson with Region 5 Education Service Center. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Audian. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Audian Paxson. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in charge of product management at NetGate. And um, I'll be your host today. And as we talk about FIDO and VPP at a high level, uh, how you can start using VPP in your home lab. And then we'll hear from three network operators and their journeys with VPP. And to wrap things up at the very end, we'll answer any questions that are submitted. So let's get started. At a high level for FIDO, this is a view of the presiding open source project where FIDO and VPP lives. In the stack diagram on the left, you'll see that the Linux Foundation has several open source projects from disaggregated hardware on the bottom of the stack up to the application layer at the top of the stack. Now, FIDO is one of the projects highlighted here in red in the middle, and it represents high performance IO services for dynamic compute environments. Now, while it looks small in this view, it's worth noting, by the way, that FIDO is one of the founding members of the Linux Foundation. And it's for people with network infrastructure providers, service provider organizations, cloud service providers, and vendors who want to leverage this technology for the commercial offerings. And technically speaking, FIDO lives um, at the data plane. VPP enables high performance software packet processing. So it's all done in software. It's in user space as opposed to kernel based uh, kernel space processing. And it performs an action on a group, or, or more accurately, a vector of packets all at one time, as opposed to processing a packet policy or an instruction on a single packet at a time. And this is what enables it to scale up to two or more orders of magnitude of throughput compared to what's possible in traditional kernel-based processing. And it takes that vector of packets and subjects them to a, a, a graph node processing instructions, a set of graph node processing instructions. And based on policy controls or program capabilities, you can force these packets to different policies or rule-based engines and treat them according to how they should be routed or blocked if that's the case. And it's fully extensible and programmable through plugins or by building apps and it can be deployed just about anywhere um, you know, on bare metal machines, white boxes, virtual machines and containers. Now that's just a quick high level tour of VPP. Um, I'd encourage you to go to the FIDO website for a much more in-depth explanation of VPP. Now, it's, VPP is more than a project, though. It's, uh, FIDO makes it consumable for a lot of real-world applications and use cases that can leverage VPP, certainly high-performance routing, which our guest speakers are going to be highlighting today. 
Um, it includes over 80 features delivered as packages that enable the building of routers, broadband, network gateways, cloud load balancers to intrusion prevention systems. And, and there's, here's a few examples of some major communication network providers and equipment manufacturers that leverage the power of VPP in their commercial offerings. Now, I represent NetGate down on the bottom left-hand side of this slide and, uh, ten, with, and we make Tensor software. That's a high performance software router. Now, NetGate, to help, uh, help further um, um, promote VPP, what we did is we made um, Tensor available for free um, to make it easier for network operators interested in trying VPP. So, um, and that's available at no charge. And this enables uh, them to harness the power of VPP without having to spend time learning about the optional packages or doing any integration. And all you have to do to get started is you go to tensor.com to register. We'll provide you a link to download the software. It's a single software download that you, you can install and get started right away. And we also provide load, loads of helpful documentation. Uh, so you can get started deploying a full featured high performance router on your own hardware. And now I'd like to start, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who can go through an example of um, how he's using VPP, um, Dan Stroyfurt with uh, ADSB Exchange. Hey everybody, uh, nice to be here. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're a little bit of a unique application here. Um, we are a, an aircraft tracking network and you can see kind of a map here of you know, this is, I think, a 48 hour period of, of where we've tracked aircraft. And um, so before we get started with VPP, I'll just tell you a little bit about, about what we do here. Um, this, this started as uh, basically a hobby project in 2016 and uh, uses uh, software defined radio and, and a bunch of volunteers, Raspberry Pis, to send in this data from, from all over the world. Um, you know, it, it, it grew pretty quick and still is. People, you know, send us uh, send us their data about uh, aircraft, and you know, as as sort of a having a background as sort of a quote hobby project, right? It uh, the, the budget was never very high, but with a background in you know network engineering and, and you know just general IT, I was you know kind of geeking out, so to speak, on the, on the back end, and um, so so. You know, as this developed, you know, we started getting a lot of different customers, uh, Fortune 500 companies, the UN, all sorts of different, all sorts of different folks wanted this data. Um, and it was, it was pretty large data. So we, we had some, we had some requirements. Um, let's see. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide there. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay. So like I said, you know, driving this was, uh, Lots of data coming both in and out 24 7 365 we were on AWS um, some of our instances were starting to get big the bandwidth costs were getting expensive. And it just wasn't a sustainable thing uh, for a project like this, so we decided to move to a colo and with that decision, you know we needed a, a router that could handle uh, a, a lot of a lot of data a lot of connections. Um, so. Looking at, at the solutions that were available, you know, the traditional vendors with uh, anything that can can run, you know, 10 plus gig with uh, BGP and that is going to be pretty expensive. Um, we we liked the open source uh, software capability, uh, you know, not not using those proprietary ASICs would, would bring down the cost quite a bit. Uh, and, and we, we found uh, VPP and Tensor through sort of a unique path. We started looking at, at PFSense again, sort of open, open source based. And then we discovered that, uh, you know, NetGate had this Tensor offering with VPP and that really worked well. You know, it, it was open source. It kind of met with our needs and, and our budget. Um, you know, there's always the option of course to build your own box, but uh, you know, NetGate had some, some hardware that they sold as a package with everything pre-installed. And, you know, honestly that made things uh, pretty easy to get started and quick. And uh, we were able to adjust uh, redundancy by just simply buying two units instead of uh, instead of one. Um, so, uh, you know, ha having really no previous experience with VPP and DPDK, um, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, in the beginning, I was kind of <laughs> I was kind of worried, OK, am I going to be able to figure out how to how to run this thing? But, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it, it was pretty easy. Uh, the, the commands are 
you know, if you know, if you're familiar with Cisco, um, you know, the commands are pretty similar and we ended up, you know, setting up uh, uh, an infrastructure like this using, you know, VRP for some redundancy here. And so we're doing, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got a couple of 10 gig, well, we've got a 10 gig uh, internet connection and we've got a couple of other one gig connections, direct connect, and we're doing some some uh, things with BGP and uh, you know some dedicated customer stuff with Direct Connect back to uh, AWS. Um, you know, really Tensor is able to handle this with no problem, and honestly, it's a fraction of the cost of you know some of the some of the big name stuff that's proprietary. So it's uh, it's it was working out very well for us so far. So. You know, my suggestion here, if you've got a similar need and maybe you don't have a huge massive budget or you're just curious um, and you're familiar with Cisco and Linux, you know, hop on board and, and check it out. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Um, our next speaker is Mike Jennings, the CEO and network operator for Box Telesis. Hi, my name is Mike Jennings. Um, <clears throat> we have... Uh, a voice company that supports mainly business communications. So we do SIP, Teams integrations, uh, infrastructure as a service for for large voice applications for emergency broadcasting services, and we need the ability to go from zero to a thousand real quick. And most of our infrastructure is built on open source technologies. Um, we have to be able to develop into those technologies to support you know, 10 calls to 25,000 calls on a dime. And so we were looking for a solution for routing. And one of the issues that we always run into is, is if we go with a commercial product, does it scale? And if it does scale, how much does it cost? And that's where we came across VPP. Um, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, thank you. Uh, so one of the requirements we needed for our solution was that application integration, um, not just at the router level, but at the actual device that we're servicing the IP for. So if we have a, an a RTP server or we have a media gateway or we have a, a some kind of hosted PBX, we want the ability to, to integrate the IP services, whether it's IPv4, V6, NATing, traffic shaping, ACLs, all of that stuff at at the actual infrastructure level and have it be done automatically as part of our systems integrations. Um, and we wanted the ability to turn this thing into a service so that it's not, it's not a piece of hardware that sits off the side that we call out, but that is completely integrated into how we deploy our infrastructure. Um, so combining the firewall, route traffic management, all of that stuff needed to be integral to whatever we went with. Um, the other requirements we needed was the ability to support DR redundancy, um, simple VRP if we're going to replace our core routers, uh, VLANing, lags, BGP, all the standards, IPsec to replace our, our Cisco IPsec firewalls. Um, we wanted to be able to do AC out scale and do it by source and destination based on uh, criteria that set up in our infrastructure. So dynamically deploying ACLs based on information that we glean from the traffic or the customer requirements. Uh, traffic shaping, uh, API for management and automation. Um, and at the time that we uh, started in 2019, we needed the cap cap capabilities for 40 gigabits. Um, we also knew that uh, based on our growth and the directions we're, we're, we're heading, we also needed to see source-based routing and 100 to 400 gig capabilities at some point. Uh, one of the main integrations that we're looking at as an infrastructure component was the ability to in integrate to KVM or, and Docker. Um, that's changed a little bit as we've matured over the last few years, but as the ori original assessment, this was on our, on our plate. So when we got into it, we played, played around with, uh, uh, with a bunch of different application space in VPP, Bird, um, some other things that actually operate at the Linux um, at the Linux interface on the actual device, physical device, and experimented with maybe building out a router. And the truth is, is that the amount of engineering resources that went behind it was outside of our scope. We just, we couldn't meet that level. 
Um, so the question was, how do we take VPP to production if it can service all of these requirements? And we liked the thought of it, but we just couldn't take that on as a, as a development project internally. So Tensor offered quite a few of the initial packages that we had looked at, but they put it all into a managed product. And although they're, although it's a commercial product, it's a managed open source project. All They're contributing back to the, the environment. They're contributing back to the, the different projects. And so it made a, an opportunity for us to, to get into the open source product without having to do all the development on our own. So Tensor really filled that, that, that group. So where we're at today, um, we spent 2019, late 2019 and all of 2020 uh, deploying into our two data centers. Uh, we have deployed IPv4 and v6. Um, we've set the groundwork for Anycast uh, so that we can deploy our Anycast um, networks to both data centers. Uh, we're also working on a third data center to bring up um, and that will be happening in 2020. Well, late at this point, 2022, because just time frame and everything's wild. Uh, the accomplishments in this in 2020 were we have fully redundant router nodes at each location. Um, we're supporting v, VRP, VLANing, lags, BGP, um, and we also have ACL integrated um, and working towards the automation of the ACL. Uh, what we're working on now is migrating off of our Cisco um, uh, IPsec tunneling servers and going to migrate that completely into our Tensor platform. Uh, traffic shaping is, uh, is something that we're looking at doing. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to accomplish that, but it's something that, uh, that is going to be required for, for us to really fully implement the um, Anycast, but we've had conversations with Tensor and it seems like it's, it's something that we're working towards and we'll be able to get there. Uh, <clears throat> 100 gig is already on the table. Um, we just have to upgrade some some hardware and we'll be there. So it's it, it's once again we're back to this you know buy the card buy the infrastructure and and you're you're up and running. You don't have to. Do, we know that Tensor will support it, so we're we're not worried about it. Um, the API management for automation is is already in the project path for the roadmap for our developers this year. We actually I already have a developer assigned to it, and they're working to integrating that into our switch directly so that we can build out uh, the dynamic routing stuff right away. So I took a three hour snapshot from our network um, when I built this slide. And in this, in this slide, I'm showing basically um, our current traffic flow and where we're going to from to and from Provo and Fargo. Uh, this is a single router in Fargo that I have a snapshot of the load on. We operate about anywhere just, just under one, maybe a load of one on that box and we've never seen any kind of contention or any packet restrictions uh, we're not oversubscribing on memory um, and this is this is about a gig of voice traffic this is all rtp so very small packets lots of them um, we also noticed that this router's been up for 104 days we've had no problems uh, we were confident in the in the actual stability of it so because there's two routers in the way they built we can shut one router down it doesn't drop the traffic bring the other router up to update it, do patches on it, whatever repairs, and then swap it out and do the other one. And we we barely see any blips in our network. So the DR is is extremely polished in the Tensor product right now. We're not have we, we don't have any problems that sometimes you run into with open source where it wasn't configured at least on my side from a engineer's perspective properly. So they've actually done all that work to make that easy. So where we're going in the future, um, we're in the process right now of migrating all of our Docker microservices to Kubernetes. And we're in the process of migrating all of our media RGP and SIP to Docker. Um, and because of the integration of VPP to Kubernetes and how we're going to be using Bird with Docker, we're going to be integrating VPP from the host all the way up to the router. And it's gonna be seamlessly integrated across both networks. So on the 2020 roadmap, any cast at the host, uh, dynamic ACL um, by endpoint, uh, IPv6 uh, automation. So there's always going to be some some issues where you have to convert, do some IPv6 natting. So that's something that's in the conversations, and we're going to be using Tensor to accomplish and VPP to accomplish. Um, 
automation for IPsec, uh, our customer-based IPsec, where they want to just set up a tum tunnel, we're going to be doing that through um, VPP and Tensor. We also have, um, we're also going to be removing the layer three from the edge. So going to a layer, uh, just a layer two device at the edge for, for carrier inter integration. Um, we're also going to be doing uh, a bird at the, uh, a VPP bird at the host for BGP, any cast integration of the host. Um, on the skunk work side of things, this is stuff that's, uh, that we're already working with and we see the, the ability to, to integrate with BPP and that is taking Prometheus, which is a monitoring tool that we're using right now for, we're integrating into all of our Docker components, um, containers, is that <clears throat> that Prometheus monitoring will allow us to collect, the, collect and analyze data based on traffic and performance and infrastructure, whether it's from Kubernetes or Docker, or whatever service we're getting that Prometheus information from, create an analytic engine that comes with Prometheus and then help us to build DDoS prevention and um, security protocols directly into our front end ACLs that we're currently using with Tensor. Um, we also are looking at the automated tap for tracing and debugs. Uh, that is something that uh, is is very interesting to us to be able to to pick a specific pick a specific interface or VLAN or device and tap that into a debug trace and do that all automatically. So um, that's where we're going, and that's how we're using BPP. Thank you, Mike. That's very interesting. This is good stuff. Um, and I'll remind everybody that if you do have questions for any one of the speakers uh, and anything you saw so far. Go ahead and put that into the uh, um, to chat panel, and we'll cover those when we're done. Next, I'd like to introduce Jerry Wilson. He's the network manager at Region Five. Hi. Um, so, yeah, uh, network manager, Region Five Education Service Center. Um, so, what we are, um, we're one of twenty um, service centers that were created by the Texas Legislature to support school districts uh, in their academic goals. Um, uh, our ESC uh, supports about uh, 40 school districts, and that's about 90,000 uh, staff and students. Um, so the role of our service center, what we do is we're kind of a uh, support and guidance um, uh, for uh, school districts um, to help achieve the uh, goals that Texas lays out for education. And in particular, my department, um, technology, is there to support the ESC uh, with uh, technology, obviously, and also uh, to offer services to districts. And one of the ways we do that, um, we're uh, offering uh, internet access. We've been doing that for many years, and um, that uh, helps uh, direct us towards the goal of you know, effective and efficient use of technology in school districts. So um, we have a number of our 40 school districts that get internet access through us. Um, they uh, also have some other services they uh, take advantage of through us. Um, but um, our generalized network diagram, you can see there, we uh, basically have them tied into our network. We have two ISPs um, for redundancy. One of those is this LEARN network, um, which is a uh, kind of a consortium of education uh, in Texas. And it offers uh, some extra services um, like internet to access, some pairing and caching, pretty good, and DDoS mitigation. Um, so one of the things that um, we have to look at is um, uh, bandwidth needs are increasing in school districts. Um, One-to-one's pretty common at this point. Um, and a lot of school districts are getting higher speed links to us all the time. Um, one of the challenges for us, however, since we're in education, um, we, we're basically acting like an ISP for them, but it's a small market. It's obviously less than 40 school districts are not gonna be any more than that. And so we, our revenue is kind of more like a nonprofit. We have to keep costs down and um, offer services just as good as an ISP or actually better in some cases because we really have a relationship with our customers. So um, our previous solution, um, we had this more or less generalized network diagram here where we had um, a routing situation where we had a device that had a limited number of uh, 10 gig ports. Um, uh, we had uh, limited throughput on it, um, uh, five gigabit, uh, but uh, we could increase that. It would cost more though. We have to pay for licensing fees for that. Um, we also have uh, some support and maintenance costs that are kind of high with that because we need to make sure that if we have any kind of device failure, we've got the ability to recover really quickly. Um, it also provided some design problems for us a little bit. You can see there that we have to 
uh, as people needed more and more 10 gig links to us, we had to like kind of tie in with other switching infrastructure that we had, and we didn't really want to go that direction. Um, so we got to the point where the device we had was reaching end of life and we're going to have to replace it. Um, it was going to be expensive to replace and or upgrade it. So we started looking around, investigating um, all our alternatives and our requirements were basically kind of what you see there. We, we needed some more flexible hardware with additional, uh, you know, uh, 10 gig links. We needed the ability to, to you know, hook uh, our disks at higher speed. Uh, we also need more throughput and the ability to scale it up. Um, currently, we needed at least uh, a little bit over 10 gig um, to make sure that we can support the demand. Um, so, uh, the other big requirement for us was that it had to be maintainable. Um, like I said, we don't, we're not going to see growth in our business, so to speak. We, we kind of have a limited market. Hey, uh, Jerry. Um, your audio just started to get a little bit garbled. I wonder if maybe you mute, unmute, or wiggle something. Try again. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. No problem. Um, so anyway, uh, I was just covering requirements. Uh, you know, uh, we needed to make sure that we had enough uh, 10 gig connectivity. Um, we needed more scalable throughput and the ability to scale that up um, year after year as we needed without having to spend a lot of money. Uh, so the costs have to be maintainable. And another requirement really that kind of is inherent with this because we have a small staff um, and uh, pressed for time a lot is that we didn't need to put a lot of extra work into it. So we were looking around, um, most vendors, um, if it was gonna have the throughput automatically just kind of solved for us, it was gonna be really expensive hardware. Um, and if it wasn't really expensive hardware, it just wasn't gonna handle the throughput. And so we were looking at every network uh, hardware vendor we could think of, and we came across uh, NetGate, which we were familiar with, and we saw Tensor and we saw VPP. And we thought, well, this is pretty interesting. I was actually kind of surprised. Um, I thought it was just code. Um, I knew it existed. I thought it was just code that vendors would use to build a product off of and that it wasn't anything you could really approach without, you know, um, without being a vendor, basically. I knew it was open source, but uh, I knew the work would be a lot. So uh, Tensor helped see me, uh, helped me see it as a, a product, something that you could take and you could uh, put into practice really quickly. And it, and it addressed all our uh, requirements, basically. It checked all the boxes and we knew we could grow on it. So um, that moves me on to our deployment. Um, so it was uh, a really nice process. Uh, we took our old config and um, from our uh, old router and put it to Tensor and it was fully featured. We didn't have to like say, oh gee, what about being able to do this, being able to do that? It, it just did everything. Um, VPP supports all the features that, you know, uh, you, we would get out of a, a, another product, a, another vendor. Um, we were uh, able to uh, rack it, configure it, power up, move cables all within the same day. It took very little time to put into actual uh, performance. And uh, the performance has been great. Um, we've not run into any question marks about you know throughput or anything like that. Um, maintenance has been easy. We've been able to make config changes. It's very, uh, uh, the documentation is clear. It's very intuitive. If you're familiar with Cisco or Juniper or any of the major vendors, then it's very easy uh, to go from that mindset to configuring VPP or Tensor. And upgrading has been just as easy as any other commercial router that I could get. So um, uh, we additionally got a cold spare too, um, just to uh, have you know, some redundancy. We're probably gonna go to VRP eventually, but it was nice to have it to kind of uh, make changes on, play around with practice on, and just um, uh, make uh, upgrade changes. And that was before uh, Home Lab was available. And now Home Lab makes that even easier. <clears throat> so we could have used VPP uh, directly, but we went the tensor route because we really, uh, like I said, small staff, we needed to get started and have something that didn't take us a lot of time. So um, where we are now, what we've learned, um, BPP was the answer. Um, it's ready to go. It does uh, what we need it to do. It's full featured. Um, it's actually been around for quite a long time. I don't know how many years, but uh, quite, a, quite a while. The documentation's nice. Um, it, it's uh, a lot of really good information out there and Tensor built a really nice product on top of it. 
So um, the other really good thing is we know we have room to grow. Um, we know we're not going to run into the same problem we just had in two more years. We know that um, we can super scale this. Um, uh, we'll probably have to get you know uh, more capable hardware, but it won't be super expensive. And uh, we've got the software in place to do it. Um, surprisingly easy and affordable to deploy, like it says right there. Um, I was kind of you know not sure at first, and we thought it was a little bit experimental, but it's uh, it just it just worked. Um, so I recommend if uh, whatever size your organization is, uh, you can do this. Download it, follow the documentation, and and you'll be up and running. It's it's great. Excellent. Thank you. So um, kind of wrap up everything uh, what we've covered. And in summary here, the VPP yields significant performance uh, and ultimately some price, price performance gains. And as um, Jerry was just talking about, um, it gives them, provides you an option to be able to uh, leverage software uh, to be able to scale your, uh, um, your, your deployment needs. So in each of these cases, we saw uh, all three of them, we saw um, deployments that had uh, immediate uh, increase in needs for uh, throughput and bandwidth and growth. Um, and then right around the corner next year for each of these, um, they need room to be able to add more bandwidth and capacity. And um, the, what we'll be able to cover is the ability to use software to do that. Um, so FIDO has made this, make it really easy to make VPP consumable today um, with solutions that are available from VPP um, and vendors that are highlighted there. And if you want to get started with it without having to uh, jump in and download code um, and without spending any money, then you can do that at tensor.com. Uh, just sign up for a subscription and then learn more about uh, other options at fido.com, uh, fido.io specifically. The links are there at the bottom of the screen. So, um, and now we can uh, field any questions from uh, the attendees. So what we have so far, um, let's see, just, just a couple of questions actually. Um, so um, I'll ask uh, the, uh, the attendees here first. Um, how long does it take to get familiar with VPP and what skill sets do you guys think is required um, to give VPP a, a full evaluation? And any one of you guys can go ahead and jump, chime in there. Uh, this is Mike Jennings. Uh, you, you know, from, from a VPP perspective, uh, if you're gonna be using this at the, at the host or you're gonna be building on top of VPP, you're gonna need to have, um, uh, infrastructure, you're going to have to have experience with Linux and development and, and Linux kernel and how you, how you build it and assemble everything to get the full performance out of it. Um, if you're, I mean, there are other systems like, like bird and stuff that make that a little easier, but, and there's a lot of really good documentation on it. It's just that you're going to have to have a lot of familiarity with, with just how that all works. Um, when it comes to, uh, uh, what skill sets you need for Tensor? It is like running a Cisco. It is like running um, any any command based router or firewall that you've ever worked with. So, Mike, uh, on that note, uh, another question that came in is how do you leverage VPP with open source routing demons such as FRR, Bird? And I think you mentioned uh, um, a couple of those examples. So, we don't. So, we chose to go with Tensor as our mm -hmm. as our as our routing daemon um bird just basically allows you to to integrate that into your bgp um but we're using we're not like inhaling the entire route table with that with that linux device we're just using it as a as a uh, negotiation and ibgp between that and tensor um uh, so we're not using frr at the host um we're relying once again on tensor which is using ffr frr for routing and i, I mean Adi and you would be better to talk to how you guys utilize it. But from our perspective, um, the VPP layer at the host is just that is just first off, it's giving us that, you know, vector packet stuff at the host. And it also gives us the ability with Bird to do BGP to Tensor. That's how we're utilizing it. Excellent. And um, also, I've, we, I've mentioned uh, several ways that 
um, FIDO's made VPP more consumable and available either through commercial offerings or through uh, software that you can download from FIDO or uh, from tensor.com. Um, but uh, we'd encourage any of the attendees also to look for opportunities to be able to contribute um, to, the, uh, to the project as well. And um, so you, there's, you can find out more information on how to do that at uh, ft.io. And that's uh, those are the only questions we have so far from the audience. So Jill, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you attending today's session. Um, as I mentioned at the start, uh, on-demand recording of this will be available in the coming days. So look out for that if you're interested. Um, and uh, stay tuned for more LFN webinars. We've got a couple more coming up this week as well. So uh, make sure you tune in and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>